Um, okay, well, welcome everybody. And thanks for joining us on this Friday afternoon. I'm Ryan Hanley of the Political Science Department at Boston College. And I am delighted uh, to be able to uh, host on behalf of this institution, um, this particular iteration of the History of Political Thought um, Consortium Workshop that uh, Jeff Church has done such a great job of putting together. Um, we are very delighted here at BC to be able to host our featured speaker today, Dr. Samuel Zeitlin. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, Dr. Zeitlin uh, right now holds the posts of Hong Kong Link Early Career Research Fellow and Lecturer in Politics at Corpus Christi, uh, Cambridge. Uh, prior to coming to Cambridge, he taught at UC Berkeley where he received his PhD uh, at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen and at the University of Chicago, where he was a Harper Schmidt Fellow. Um, Sam is a political theorist, historian of political thought with uh, admirably broad interests. Uh, he's published in such journals recently as Review of Politics, History of Political Thought, History of European Ideas, the Politisches Denken Jahrbuch, uh, Global Intellectual History, and Modern Intellectual History. Um, he is this year the co-author uh, with Lars Vinks of Carl Schmitt's early legal uh, theoretical writings that was published by Cambridge just a few months back. And currently Dr. Zeitlin is at work revising his dissertation on the political philosophy of Francis Bacon, which is being uh, prepared uh, to appear in monograph form. And I believe it's part of this larger project that he's gonna be speaking about today under the title, Francis Bacon on Peace and the 1604 Treaty of London. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Zeitlin. It's very good to have you here, Sam. Thank you, and thank you for that very, very generous introduction. I'd like to thank all of the organizers. Um, and can, can people hear me? Can, can people hear, hear my voice? Um, so I would like to thank uh, the organizers of the Duke uh, BC Houston Political Theory Colloquium, not least Professor Hanley and Professor Shell for this great uh, invitation. Um, not least, thank you to all of you for suffering uh, this paper and presentation. I look forward very much to the discussion uh, and your comments in the Q&A. Francis Bacon was not averse to the color purple. Purple figures prominently in Bacon's color experiments in the Silva Silvarum. In the 224th experiment of that work, discussing the admixture of, vis of visible species, Bacon writes, quote, I suppose likewise that if there were two lanthorns of glass, the one a crimson, the other an azure, and a candle within either of them, those colored lights would mingle and cast upon a white paper a purple color. Writing his late essay of gardens, Bacon noted that purple periwinkle flowers are fit for the adornment of a garden in early winter. For Bacon, purple may adorn an honorific emblem, as in the Feast of the Tirsan in Bacon's New Atlantis, in which particularly fruitful patriarchs are presented with golden grapes, which may be, quote, enameled purple with a little sun set on the top. For Bacon, purple may signify a certain regality of the kind adopted by Alexander's generals in their conquest of Mesopotamia in imitation of the Medes and Persians who ruled before the Macedonian conquest. Mixed of crimson and azure, signifying honor, beauty, and regality, Francis Bacon regarded purple as a color not unfit for himself. At the very least, for his wedding celebration, Bacon is attested to have donned himself wholly in purple attire. In a letter dated 11 April 1606, Dudley Carleton writes to John Chamberlain that, quote, Sir Francis Bacon was married yesterday in Marybone Chapel. He was clad from top to toe in purple. No less than in his literary essays, scientific experiments, in his fable, The New Atlantis, and at his wedding celebration, Bacon devoted the entirety of one of his early mask pageants to a group of speeches addressed to a character dubbed the Prince of Purple. Performed over the winter holidays in 1594-5 for festivities at, the, at Gray's Inn, Bacon's Inn of Court, Bacon's orations for this pageant take the form of a series of set speeches by privy councillors to the Prince of Purple, each advocating a particular endeavor such as sport or virtue building or philosophy. While the second speech is addressed to advocating contemplation or philosophy, the fourth speech advocates absoluteness of state, end quote. The very first speech addressed to the Prince of Purple takes the form of an advocacy for war. Bacon's first counselor 
in this pageant exhorts the Prince of Purple that, quote, if you embrace the wars, your trophies and triumphs will be as continual coronations that will not suffer your glory and contentment to fade and wither, end quote. As Alan Stewart writes in his introduction to the Grays and Revels in the first volume of the Oxford Francis Bacon, in this court mask, quote, in the midst of Gray and Revelry, Bacon seized the opportunity to forward plans that would remain central to his philosophy for the rest of his life, end quote. The subject of the paper this afternoon is neither the color purple nor the Prince of Purple. However, Bacon's view of peace bears some family resemblance to the early orations of his mask pageant addressed to the fictive and colorful prince. The early Baconian counselor advocating war to the Prince of Purple in the Grayson Revels of 1594-5 makes no mention of peace, but he does refer to power. Victories in war will augment the power gradient of states and kingdoms facing the future. No less, Bacon's counselor exhorts the Prince of Purple that, quote, to embrace that which doth not disparage you, i.e. to embrace war, stressing that, quote, if any prince do otherwise, it is either weakness in his mind or in his means, end quote. Any strong prince will embrace war, on Bacon's view, when she or he can, and thus only weakness or impotence in mind or in means would prevent other princes or states from, address from aggressing and attacking. The paper argues that for Bacon, across his political, philosophic, and literary career, the criterion for one's own peace is the weakness or incapacity or impotence of one's opponents. The paper proceeds in two parts. The first outlines Francis Bacon's view of peace, particularly in relation to the Habesian view of peace, which arises in part uh, in opposition to it. The second part of the paper lays out Bacon's view of peace in relation to Bacon's positions on several of the foreign policy issues of his own time, particularly treaties and empire, and the polemical uses to which Bacon put his view of peace to critique and criticize the 1604 Treaty of London. The paper concludes with some reflections on how the concept of peace may remain central, consciously or unconsciously, to how theorists of international relations think about foreign policy, drawing both on Bacon as well as positions in more recent literature. The Habesian position on the question uh, might offer a helpful juxtapositive context and contrast. For Hobbes, if uh, Professor Hanley uh, wants peace with me, uh, and I want peace uh, with Professor Hanley, and we each know that the other wants peace. For as long as we both know this, Professor Hanley and I have peace between the two of us. We might think of the Habesian view of peace as a dispositional view of peace. The Baconian view is different. For Bacon, there is seemingly no peace between equals, even if they wish it. Bacon, peace is not dispositional, but one might say uh, capacitarian. If power A is impotent with respect to power B, then power B is at peace with A, but not necessarily vice versa. No less, the Baconian notions of, notion of peace admits somehow of the appellations of true and false peace. An objector might reasonably ask, what could that possibly mean? In Of Unity and Religion, Bacon distinguishes two modes of false peace, ignorant peace and contradictory peace. Ignorant peace, where the parties are unaware of the capacities of their opponents. Contradictory peace is based, by contrast, on, quote, an admission of contraries in fundamental points. False peace is the name of peace given falsely to states of affairs where actual or potential warfare subsists. True peace is something else entirely. A true peace on Bacon's account rightly obtains when a nation or state cannot be harmed militarily by its neighbors, opponents, or enemies, even if they wished to do so. This true peace is enjoyed by those powers whose enemies are impotent to do them harm, according to the maxim that, quote, there is no sure league, but the impuissant to do hurt, end quote. In Bacon's view, rather than enter into league with one's adversaries, it is better to ensure that they are fully endowed with the impuissance to do hurt, which is to say, fully disempowered. Let us illustrate Bacon's view with an example drawn from Roman history, an example which Bacon offers himself. In his advancement of learning, Bacon describes the emperor Hadrian as spending, quote, his whole reign, which was peaceable, in perambulation per per or survey of the Roman empire, end quote. Now, not insignificantly, the reign of the emperor Hadrian from 117 to 138 CE was co-temporal with the Third Roman-Jewish War, 
the Merit Bar Kokhba, the Bar Kokhba Revolt, in which some historians, such as Dio Cassius, estimate that more than half a million Jews perished in fire. Bacon's point in describing Hadrian's imperial reign as peaceable is not Bacon's ignorance of Roman history or some belief that the Bar Kokhba revolt or the Third Roman Jewish War was not a war. Uh, this fits Bacon's definition of war as a trial by arms. Rather, Bacon's point would be that Bar Kokhba never really had the military capacity to challenge the Roman Empire with any expectation of success. Peace for Rome understood as the power gradient based upon overwhelming military capacity that secures Rome's rule, above all in its metropole rather than in its periphery, was never threatened in Bacon's estimation by the revolt. Baconian peace is peace for someone. Peace for Rome is compatible with war for Bar Kokhba. By now it should be clear that in addition to being a sub substantive and relative view of peace, i.e. one party can be at peace um, with another, with, in relation to another party um, who is at war, um, Bacon's theory of peace is an alibi for empire and for peace through military as well. It is a definition of peace which is not one understood in the absence of armed conflict. Moreover, Baconian true peace is a polemical concept, not least directed against the centerpiece of Jacobean foreign policy, the 1604 Treaty of London, which concluded the Armada Wars between England and then Britain and Spain. In a report of a conference with the House of Lords delivered to the House of Commons on 22 June 1604, Bacon is recorded as observing quote, the nature of the peace then being negotiated by Robert Cecil, Bacon's cousin, with Spanish delegations from Philip III is, quote, not within the competence of this house. This is Bacon to Parliament. Yet it, the absence of the Commons competence on the matter of the treaty did not prevent Bacon from speaking at greater length on what he considered to be the content of negotiations. The notes in the Commons Journal report Bacon's rather distant assessment of peace negotiations, quote, peace only between the persons of the King of England and Spain, dash, nothing articulate, dash, a mere cessation or abstinence from hostility, end quote. Such a cessation or abstinence from hostility fails quite straightforwardly Bacon's already articulated definition of true peace. Impuissance to do hurt or incapacity to do harm, not ab absence from fighting, is the firm Baconian ground of peace. Bacon's assessment of the Treaty of London during the time of its negotiation hardly counts as a ringing endorsement of the Crown's position. Not only amidst negotiations for the treaty, does Bacon characterize the negotiating position of his cousin, the principal secretary, Robert Cecil, as, quote, nothing articulate. Rather, Bacon's view also amounts to implicit critique of the Stuart negotiating position. A mere cessation or absence from battle fails Bacon's criteria of actual or authentic peace. The sum of my argument, therefore, throughout the paper is that for Bacon, peace is the incapacity of a state to be harmed militarily by any other opposed state, even if that state uh, desired to inflict harm. This inflects both Bacon's foreign policy generally, um, and in particular, his opposition to the 1604 of London. Uh, thank you, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Sam. Um, uh, I too am eager that there be peace between us, whether on Baconian or Habesian grounds. And uh, to facilitate that, how about I defer to you to field your own questions? People are uh, sort of local practice is to use the um, uh, use the raise hand function. So if people can just indicate their um, questions by way of the raised hand function, Sam, I take it that you can see uh, the raised yeah. hands in the queue. I'll let you go ahead and take it from here. Thank you, um, Professor Gillespie. Uh, yes, Sam. I, the uh... The peace of 1604, you know, certainly didn't uh, wasn't enough for uh, for James the first. I mean, that that was one of the reasons that he pursued the Spanish match. So I'm wondering whether or not, you know, the, if we think about the establishment of peace more as a process than anything else. I mean, clearly he was trying to establish a a, a lasting relationship with Spain that would. Uh, that would guarantee the peace and save England, not just England, but Spain from the ruinous expenses of, of war, which was, you know, which was really a significant, uh, you know, uh, burden for both of them. So I'm wondering whether or not you think that, I mean, does, does Bacon recognize that this is a long process that the king, now, obviously the Spanish match was not terribly popular <laughs> 
in in England, uh, and it was ruined by the gunpowder plot. But but anyway, I mean, or the relationship with Spain was ruined there. But but he, you know, even then, I mean, just the, the 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 negotiators included the Howard family, which who were all crypto Catholics. So I'm wondering whether or not. It, you know, there wasn't something deeper going on and whether Bacon recognized that. So it's great. So I'll kind of take it take reverse a great question. So Bacon is a political opponent of the Howards, and we see that in the Overbury affair, which implicates them. He prosecutes uh, them um, as state's counsel in his capacity as attorney general. Um, and he also doesn't like them politically, but he kind of can't say, he can't be so open about that. So in parliament, where you do have a more Puritan constituency, Bacon is much more um, anti-Spanish in Parliament than he is uh, at the council table. But at the council table, in relation to Spanish match, when he is uh, Lord Keeper of the Great Seal and then Lord Chancellor, he does, he doesn't overtly oppose the Spanish match, but he says, if you can only really, he says to James, you can only pursue the Spanish match if you have unanimity at the council table. And in the 16 teens, you know, I mean, the Spanish match issue goes on um, almost until 1624, almost the last minute, almost to 1624. Um, Bacon's and Bacon falls from power in January of 1621. So it even the, the, the Spanish match issue actually goes beyond Bacon's own career, um, at least his career in government, in active government. Bacon at the council table says, you can only really, he says to James, you can only really pursue with effectiveness a un, with a unanimous council behind you, the Spanish match. But uh, Winwood, who's the successor to Cecil, opposes the Spanish match openly. Um, he then die, he later dies. But Bacon, Bacon basically is looking for alibis for why James shouldn't pursue it, um, in part because also Bacon doesn't think um, that Spain's rule is felicitous for, um, for the project of science. In other words, you can have, in other words, the Inquisition um, itself is incompatible with the Inquisition of nature. I know, Professor Gopsi, have I, have I handled this? Well, no, I, 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 I agree with all everything you've said. My question is, if you understand peace as a process in which you bust up over time, in which you have, you know, trade relations, in which you have marriage relations, uh, you know, I, I wonder whether, I mean, I wonder whether Bacon saw the idea of establishing peace in that way, or was it simply a balance of, kind of a balance of power question? So that's that's great. So I, I missed I missed that I missed that part of the question. But okay. So for the Howards, and that also goes it links directly to the Howards. James, both in domestic and in international affairs. So so the, the notion of peace is a process of trust building. Peace is marriage, let's say. Peace is matrimony. Um, that is uh, closer to James's view. That's as it were we could say a big uh, in a big picture Jacobean view of peace. It's James's view of peace. Um, but Bacon thinks both in domestic affairs and in international affairs, peace as matrimony is not um, the operative peace. Now he's thinking about his own experience of matrimony, um, but he also doesn't, he doesn't think it works for the Howards domestically. Um, it doesn't actually keep them from, you know, assassinating people in the Tower of London, um, and he prosecutes them from that. And he also thinks it doesn't work internationally. Um, and he favors both princes of Wales, both Henry Stuart and then the future Charles I, who have a more robust stance towards Spain, and as it were, we could say a militarist or militant posture towards Spain. The, the 1612 edition of the essays prior to the death, so Bacon doesn't dedicate works to dead people. He only dedicates his books to the living. Um, but he, he, so he has to, when Henry Stuart, the first um, heir to James dies in 1612. Bacon had in manuscript dedicated it to Henry Stewart to the Prince of Wales, but he then cuts that out and changes it to his brother-in-law, John Constable. Um, but then his later works, it's I, you can actually hear, I'm um, thinking about this and the gunpowder plot is actually because it is the 5th of November, you can actually hear the fireworks outside. So I apologize for the ambient noise, uh, but that's actually coming in um, to, to my ears. So I apologize, but yeah, there's no way I can turn that off without turning off my sound. But um, so going back to so that's the gunpowder plot outside. Um, I'm trying to think of, so peace is a process. Bacon doesn't think that that works. Um, and he, he dedicates both um, 1612 essays in manuscript to um, someone who's, who favors a more militant posture with Spain and later works, including considerations such a more with Spain is dedicated to the next Prince of Wales, to Charles. Um, and in effect, depending, if you, if you read the New Atlantis as an appendix to the Silva Silvarum, which it was in the initial editions, that work is also dedicated to um, to Charles. Um, so I guess it has a reader glad to receive, but a reader that is not 
um, in favor of the view of peace as matrimony. Peace is a process of trust building. He thinks that's maybe not possible across a confessional divide, I mean, perhaps across that confessional divide. And does that, does that speak to your question? I feel like sure. I'm- Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Fumarescu and then Tim Brennan. <clears throat> Muted, muted. Yeah. I think you may be muted. Um. Yeah, sorry, I apologize, yeah. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of questions, more theoretical than historical. So the first part, it's, it's about hubs, which you mentioned in the abstract and, and briefly in the beginning, uh, like uh, how do we know that uh, hubs position uh, it's in relation, it's uh, arises in part in opposition to Bacon's do you have some proofs? Because I don't know. So is no. that, are there I'm not finished. Are there historical proofs or not? Yeah, so for example, so here, here are the warrants. So in Aubrey's brief lives, the warrant for Hobbes is, uh, for warrant for Bacon's life is Hobbes, right? So I guess it's also partially Hobbes, Hobbes saying that he knows Bacon. So that, so in other words, Bacon, so in, and in the life of Hobbes, in Aubrey, in the brief lives, um, Aubrey writes that Hobbes tells him that Hobbes was a secretary to Bacon and amanuensis. Um, so I have actually, I have here, I guess, Aubrey's, Aubrey's brief okay, live. So, so um, Hobbes so, knew Bacon, but what that, that proves that, here comes my second question. Do you see I, I, like, that Hobbes wrote in opposition to Bacon? Because hmm. Hobbes writes that, that covenants without a sword are, are by, but words. So the distinction between Hobbes' sword and Bacon's sword is that Hobbes' sword is on a third party's hands, and Bacon's sword is in one of the two parties' uh, hands. But it's still the necessity about the necessity of the sword. So I was wondering, how can you be so sure that this is in opposition to? Uh, you may say it's, it's a difference, a nuance, but I don't see it as an opposition. And and to finish. Uh, to to uh, give the floor is like I enjoy it very much from a historical perspective. But why is this? Uh, why is Bacon's uh, position uh, on war and peace theoretically uh, interesting? Because I would say that's more like okay, that's realism. It's just not applied. Doesn't apply only to like to the Romans, but I think Genghis Khan would say the same thing without being a philosopher. The heck, I have the biggest sword; I can decide when it's peace and when it's war. Yeah. So, so, and this um, goes also to um, the comment that Professor Glassy just put in the chat. Um, but also, there are all there are. I'll, I'll lay out a few further warrants. So for example, the library, Hobbes controls a library um, for the Devonshire family. Um, the hard, it's the Hardwick Hall Library. Um, in the library catalog, there are manuscripts, Baconian manuscripts, which exists only there. In other words, and it's the same noble family that's persisted across um, the generations, the Cavendish family, which endows things like Lucy Cavendish College and Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge. Um, so there are Baconian manuscripts, and it's important. Um, one manuscript in particular is Bacon's Bacon on the Use Gentium. So Bacon on the Law of Peoples or the Law of Nations, um, Bacon on International Law. That exists only um, in Hobbes's possession. There's um, J.J. Pocock supervised a PhD dissertation on this. It was found um, in the late 70s, early 1980s um, by Mark, it was a PhD by Mark Neustadt from 1987 at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and so there, there is actually, which then produces um, both a transcription and a translation of that uh, manuscript. Um, so, that, so there's also there are there are Baconian manuscripts. I don't want to interrupt you on this part. I I don't want to interrupt you on this part. The question was not if Hobbes knew Bacon. The question right, so, was to what extent he wrote in opposition to Hobbes to Bacon. Ah, okay. So, so here, so that's so okay. Um, if if you're then satisfied that Hobbes knew Bacon, so that maybe the first part of your question. Going to the second part of your question, um, in De Kive, there's a consideration of tax. You know, how do you finance the state? How do you do? How do you organize a fiscal state? Hobbes says, well, there are these people who think that you can you can finance the state by prize capture. In other words, you can finance the state by taking other people's stuff. Now, Francis Bacon thinks that. He actually opposes under Elizabeth in Parliament, he opposes raising taxes, even for war, which he favors. He favors the wars. And he says, we, we shouldn't actually vote for the taxes. This is for the 1593 supply bill. 
They can say, we shouldn't vote for the taxes. There are other ways of actually financing the state. And he says, well, we could actually just take Spanish stuff. Um, you know, we, you know we, we pirate their ships. They've taken that material, whatever they're bringing back to Spain, they've taken it illegally. We could take it and that would finance the state. And Hobbes says, actually, that's too risky. It's in De Kive. And he says he favors, as, as you know, he favors a VAT tax. He favors consumption tax. He actually thinks that that's the most just form of taxation. Um, but there, there Hobbes is writing directly against Bacon on the issue of state finance, but also on the issue of war. Um, so he says, you know, it's too risky. You could actually lose your state um, by invading other people's, you know, things, ships, countries um, to finance the state. So that would be um, maybe one place where Hobbes is running against Bacon. But also the volitional conception of peace, where you want peace, I want peace, I want peace with you, you want peace with me. Um, and if we both know that, that that's sufficient for having peace, yeah, that's different from the Baconian view, right? And um, and Hobbes is also, I think, cognizant of the Baconian position um, in all of these different works, both in the works that he has in, in his own library, um, which no one else has, but also he knows the Baconian text really well. He's Bacon's secretary. Um, so I take, I mean, I take Professor Gillespie's point, but I also think um, that I would say there are also places, there are many places where Hobbes agrees with, with Bacon, including on the point that you raised to some extent, covenants aren't, <laughs> covenants without the sword aren't valid, but Hobbes is more interested in that as it were, internal internal politics. In international politics, they have different stances. In other words, Bacon favors the more militant posture toward um, other countries, need invading other countries, where Hobbes is more reserved, where he's he's more for um, restraint in international affairs. I'm not sure, Professor Fumarescu, have I answered your question um, to some extent? To some extent, uh, yes, I, I, I leave it here. But once again, what, what's the theoretical, what's the theoretical importance of Bacon's position, because I, I failed to see it. Again, Genghis Khan, I think, would agree with Bacon with no background in philosophy or British politics or anything like that. And I think any any bomb from the streets will say, if I have the biggest sword, I decide what is peace and what it's worth. So yeah, so I guess I'm not I'm not trying to endorse the Baconian position or anything that Genghis Khan would favor. Um, <laughs> And no, nor am I nor am I trying to say that this is a, a theory for the for the present. I mean, this is a theory from the 16th and the seventh early 17th century. But um, you know, different different theories. So that, I mean, you could contrast, for example, Bacon with John Mearsheimer. John Mearsheimer has a different view of international affairs. He doesn't think um, that um, certain forms of hegemony are possible. Um, Bacon does think that those forms of hegemony are possible if you have if certain technological um, and other presuppositions are fulfilled. And so that would be a contra contrast to some positions in, in contemporary international relations theory. For example, also other theorists like Kent Waltz, Kent Waltz thought um, every country should have atomic weapons. Um, Bacon didn't, and that that would be good for peace. Francis Bacon, if you know, resurrected, I guess one can't impute views to him, but if one were to examine his view of peace, it might have the implication that the Kent, Kent Waltz's position on that question in particular, um, there might be other positions that one might take, let's say. Does that speak? Does that speak to the potential contemporary relevance of of the view? Oh, I think I'm good. I'm good for now. Um, Tim Brennan, then uh, David Clinton. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, I also have a theoretical rather than a historical question. And so, um, you you argue against the view that peace, as Bacon understands it, is unattainable. You deny that pretty strongly. Um, but isn't that actually true in some sense? And I don't mean this as a criticism of Bacon, but actually more as a praise of his realism. And isn't it just true that if the standard of peace is the powerlessness of your enemies to seriously harm you, then there always is some room for doubt, not only with the Spains of the world, but also with the Vatican's and maybe even the Micronesias of the world, and, and and so might not the lesson of Bacon be, even if we're not at war at any given time, it's worth remembering that we're never fully and securely at peace. Whereas Hobbes's position seems to be, uh, if we're not at war, we're at peace. And Hobbes could say, yeah, sure, there's such a thing as a fragile peace or a dangerous peace, but still, it's peace. And Bacon wants to say, no, you should really actually. Remember, there is no real peace if you, if you think this through fully. 
Yeah, so I agree. I agree with your last assessment of Hobbes. Um, and I guess also for, for Bacon, it depends, as, as you rightly know, it depends on the historical situation. So um, Bacon does regard, let's say, post-1588 um, England, but also but then you know, post-1588 England, after the Armada, the Spanish Armada crashes on you know, the, the rocks of Scotland, crashes on, crashes on the Scottish shore, he regards that country as being at peace in some sense. Um, or one might say, if you took the Baconian definition of peace, if you kind of did, if you plucked, as it were, the pearl um, in Hannah Arendt's phrase, you pluck the pearl out and you say, well, post-1945 um, world, up until the point where the Soviets have atomic weapons, one might say there is something like peace. It may, that may not be accurate, but that, that could potentially be used in, in that brief you know, four-year period where only the United States have atomic weapons. That could be, that's a potential satisfaction of the position. And it, Tim, am I speaking to your question or? Yeah, you are, but I, I just want to, I mean, you don't need atomic, I mean, you could have a dozen, we know we could have a dozen men with knives and box cutters uh, could do real harm to a country, right? As we've said, but I think there are 17th century equivalents of this too, right? Assassinations and so on. You don't have to be a world mega power to be able to inflict on a country. And so it seems to me, if you take this position seriously, then, then really, I mean, you can have something that you could speak of as peace, uh, but really it, it, it's not actually peace if, if peace requires the, the impotence of your enemies. I mean, it's an apt, it's an apt observation. For example, um, you know, BC is at, at least historically a, a Jesuit institution. It's a crime in 1580s England to be a Jesuit on English soil. And the punishment for that crime is being hung, drawn, and quartered. And Bacon, when people are caught being Jesuits um, in England, Bacon is on the torture warrants from the 1580s, 90s, you know, aughts and teens of the 16, 16 aughts, 16 teens. So Bacon is involved in torturing people who are caught, is were engaged in religious, you know, crimes of religious espionage or attempted assassinations on confessional grounds. So Bacon is then involved in that, um, you know, from the Protestant side and from the side of the state. Um, so he's cognizant of the kind of thing as well that I think perhaps, you know, if one wants to frame it that way, I don't know. Tim, am I, am I speaking to your point or? Yeah, yeah. And I guess it just, I mean, so there's just a question of interpretation of what exactly Bacon, so when he says, for example, Clinius who flat out denies the possi possibility of peace, that that's an excess of speech, you know, that, that's not to say it's flat out wrong, right? It's the sort of thing you could imagine Aristotle saying about something Plato says or, or something, uh, you could imagine Locke saying that in relation to something Hobbes says. Uh, and so the, diff, the, and I think to some extent you're sympathetic to it, that he's, he's not totally opposed to what Clinius is saying. I, I'm suggesting maybe he's even, he's even closer to Clinius than, than you're suggesting. And even what he says about the English situation in the aftermath of the war with Spain, it's, it's, it's relative, I mean, there are some signs that it's, it's couched. He's not simply saying, this is true and secure peace. He's saying, well, I, at this time, I don't know of any power that can offend us, but that, that's, you know, there's a temporal element to that and things never stand still. And there's also the question of what he knows, right? Does he have a full knowledge of the capacity of Spain at any given time? Could you ever have that knowledge for sure? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, just, I, I suppose it's just a question of, of how you interpret those sort of ambiguous statements or whether, or whether they're more ambiguous than you're suggesting. Yeah, I guess also, the, well, the, the question would be, perhaps Bacon is closer to Clinius when he quotes Clinius, which is in 1624, um, and closer to the view that peace is obtaining when he's, when he's writing and speaking in Parliament um, in the 1590s in the aftermath of um, the defeat of the Spanish Armada. So, that, I mean, he's cognizant also that the view can change, right? If the view is the impuissance of opponent powers to do hurt, um, that changes with the military capacity of one's opponents. I mean, so, so it's, it's, there's a built-in relativity of the, of comparative military preparedness into the definition of peace. And so as that changes, particularly when, um, you know, the state can't finance itself, there's, and as Professor Gillespie was pointing out, there's a finance problem from 1611 onwards that they, they can't pass supply bills or rather James can't get supply bills through parliament um, from 1611 onwards. And so he, and that also forces his hand to try to pursue um, you know, marital politics that might be financially favorable or fiscally favorable to the English state and the British state. 
um, in the 16 teens and early 1620s. Thanks. Uh, Professor, Professor Clinton and then Beckett Ruda. Yes, th th thank you. Thank you for a fascinating paper. Uh, I come at this through uh, my own uh, subfield of international politics. And um, I've taught both Bacon and Hobbes, but I never thought of bringing them together in this very interesting way. Uh, just following up on the, on the last couple of questions, it seems, it seems that Bacon's position is uh, pure, purely relational and bilateral. That is one has peace with another center of power if that power is not sufficient to do serious harm to oneself. It would not make sense in general to speak of a, an era of world history as being peaceful, since it could be in some bilateral relations and not in others. The, it, it might be that Bacon would say that I can be at peace with you as long as you are not able to conquer me. But as what you were just saying, there's, there's a large area, a large gradient between being able to commit even a serious terrorist action against you, which would not threaten your hold on power or your territorial integrity, and being able to conquer you outright. I could cause serious harm to you in some way between those two extremes, if I could, even if I was not capable of depriving you of power, then you would not be at peace with me. You would not be safe from my doing serious harm to you. Is that a, 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 an accurate uh, statement of, of Bacon's position on peace? Yeah, so I mean, you write about um, whether it would actually damage territorial integrity, one's geopolitical position, um, and one could put that put that as a question to any act, to an assassination or to any act of terror, even if it's localized, does it actually harm the metropole's relative position, particularly if it's in a provincial space? Um, so I guess it does it does raise an issue about the potential ambiguity of the definition. Um, but so I mean, there's as you, as you point out, Professor Clinton, there's um, Purely, you know, the purely relational bilateral. Well, Bacon's also interested in potential, at least the potentiality of universal empires, whether that's Rome or the British Empire that he would favor, which is a British Empire that seizes Spanish colonial holdings, um, and, and it goes back to uh, Professor Fumarescu's quote, uh, seizes Spanish colonial holdings and occupies. There's a play, point in Parliament where Bacon says, "I think our our laws are fit to govern, and it were the world." So, in other words, the the fitness of English law to be world law. That has imperial implications um, of a non-diminutive kind, one might say. Um, and so he, I think Bacon can imagine, does imagine, universal empire. And it's not an accident that he uses Roman examples, including um, Hadrian. Um, and so he says, you know, it's a time of universal peace. Um, so that's, you know, the whole of which was, was peaceful. So, but yeah, so I, I, am, I, am I speaking to your question? Where, I mean, I think you're highlighting an important ambiguity in the definition about, about harm, as, or, or he says, impuissance to do hurt. Well, hurt to what extent or hurt on what domain? I think I would say, you know, hurt to, hurt to the metropole, but also hurt to the territory power um, and, yeah, imperial sway of that power. But it is, you know, obviously, if there's an assassination or if there's some terrorist event, you know, one soldier dies, you could say that's hurt. But there's another sense in which, you know, if a you know one soldier dies in a province, it doesn't necessarily reflect the you know or alter the relative power position between two powers. Um, Professor Clinton, am I speaking to your question? Yeah, or? Yes, you're, you're very much speaking to to the question, and it's very illuminating. I just say that an imperial peace under Bacon's understanding would have to be uh, built brick by brick through bilateral superiority over every other possible challenger. That is, you, you'd have to be able to compare Britain to Spain, to France, to every other center of power, only when you were assured in all of those relationships could you say that in the international society as a whole, you occupied something like a hegemonic or imperial position. I think that's correct. I think I think that is Bacon's view. The last, so what you've just described is Bacon's view. Good, thank you. 
Uh, Beckett Ruda. Hello. Uh, thank you. This was a really interesting paper. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, so I just have a quick question. Um, Bacon claims that war is a trial between princes and states uh, in which they lack a temporal judge. And he understands true peace, according to your paper, as a situation in which a state's metropole is immune to harm from its rivals. So I was wondering whether what, he's, what he appears to be calling peace is a situation in which, um, as uh, Professor Clinton was just describing, one, uh, one city, or one, sorry, one state has such um, an overwhelming power position compared to its rivals that it can effortlessly prevent, keeping with the trial metaphor, all of their efforts to press their claims um, at least preventing those from being consequential for the, the safety of its, of its heartland. So um, if that's the case, I was wondering whether um, this situation is tantamount to the superior state um, installing itself as the temporal judge. Um, and if that inference is correct, I was wondering if you think it's fruitful to compare this at all to the social compact that we see later in people like Hobbes and Locke. So can, can the question had two parts. Can you say the first part? Can you repeat the first part? So, yes. So, see. oh, sorry. Yeah. So the first part is um, the, is that the, the situation of the polity that's in a superior position to its rivals, um, whether that is tantamount to the, the polity becoming the temporal judge in the, um, the, the, the sort of framework that Bacon had constructed for war as being a trial. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, sh I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm also not, sh I'm not sure that that's, that's the kind of thing Bacon is thinking about. Mm. Um, I don't think he expresses it in that way. Um, so I think, for example, in the Bar Kokhba revolt or the Merit Bar Kokhba, Bacon's not saying Rome has placed itself in the position of God. Um, there's still, you know, when, you know, in that, in the war, there can still be war in Judea um, or in Roman occupied Judea without, um, without Rome placing itself in the position of God necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. So, Right. So I think that would be, so I think I want to say that for Bacon, I think Bacon's answer, he doesn't, he's not thinking about it in those terms. I think he would probably say no to that part of the question. Okay. Um, does that then obviate the second part of the question? I do think it sort of undermines the second part of the question. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I appreciate you um, making that clear just to make sure I understand why he would say no. Does this have to do with the disjunction between his uh, definition of peace and his definition of war that you drew attention to um, as being uh, something that distinguishes him from Hobbes? Yeah, so I guess, so for example, there can still be, Rome can still be at peace, even if there's war in one of its provinces, for example. I mean, that, that's the example that he gives actually. So in, for Hadrian, yeah, right, right. there is a massive war in Roman occupied Judea, um, but there's not, um, it is, the, an entirely peaceable reign from Bacon's, from in Bacon's estimation. Yeah, no, and I, I understand that he separates them. I guess my question is, is aimed at probing whether you can actually bridge his definition of peace and his definition of war. And it sounds like you're, you are resisting connection, so. Um. Well, I guess, so you can have, um, I guess it's not spatial, I guess, so it's just junctive spatially. So there's that element, and that goes back to um, things that um, Professor from Rescue and Tim Brennan were, were drawing out, um, that there can be a country that has, as it were, um, peace in the broad sense, while there being um, a localized war within the, or an empire, there can be localized war within an empire while that empire is still at peace from Bacon's perspective. Similarly, for example, in ba to use the example Bacon wants to use, for a Britain that is becoming imperial, insofar as Brit that Britain is seizing Peru, 
which is how the new Atlantis opens. So we sailed from Peru. Well, Peru is a Spanish colony. Right now, there's a debate, and Jerry Weinberger, um, familiar to this audience, um, you know, writes, writes he, he tries to negotiate. Are the sailors um, in the new Atlantis British, or are they Spanish? Um, well, they, they write in English, and so he just he decides, but they also, there's, they're narrated as, as um, speaking in Spanish to the, to the, to the Benzlemites whom they encounter. Now, however that might be, Peru is a Spanish colony. And so if, if the point of the New Atlantis beginning is some people who are writing in English as it were departing from um, what at, at the time the Bacon is writing is a Spanish colony. Um, so one could imagine as it were, Britain is at peace while there is as it were, war with Spain in Peru. And, and so it's, it's a complicated, it's a complicated set of things, but I know Beckett, is that speaking to your question? Uh, yeah, no, and I I, uh, I found that helpful. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have um, Professor Stoffer. Uh, so I, I, the uh, Professor Stoffer next, then Professor Wilford, Professor Hanley, Professor Scott, uh, Professor Clinton again, and then Professor Orwin. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you very much, Sam. Um, I don't know how clearly this is going to come out as a question, but I'll just sort of express what I'm what 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 I'm wondering about. What I'm wondering about is this the spirit or the intention of what you're presenting as Bacon's definition of peace. In other words, is it best seen as an in, as intended to give the, the the very best definition of what peace is, or is it really meant to implet, um, you know to convey an implicit counsel and to 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 to, to is it's advice more than it is definition. Because the reason I wonder is treated as definition, it's extremely paradoxical. I mean, it has results like this, that Canada, that Canada has been at war with us in the last 20 years, and we have not been at war with Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, if, if peace is just defined as relative power disparities. So it has, it's a very paradoxical way of thinking about what peace is. And so I wonder whether the definition isn't in fact meant to say something like this. The real question is not peace or war, it's whether you're threatened or not threatened. And to direct the question, to direct people's attention by means of an apparent definition to the thought that whether you're threatened or not threatened is really the more fundamental question than whether you're nominally at peace or nominally at, at war. If that's the case, I also wonder what lesson Bacon, is that a lesson only for the strong or is it also meant to convey a counsel to the weak? In which case, what exactly would that counsel be? Never trust the strong. If you're in a position of relative weakness, you should always regard yourself as embattled and never make an alliance with a stronger power. If that's the advice, it strikes me as excessively militaristic and unwise advice. It, it may be the thing that you just said it is the last thing, and you, uh, you know, so it may be that. Um, let me to go back to it. So, um, I'm not sure that Bacon conveys counsels to the weak, right? I mean, this is a this is a noble, this is an aristocrat, um, this is someone in power, um, in of unity and religion. The third essay in the 1625 edition of the essays, Bacon says, um, it's the greatest sin in the world um, to place the sword in the people's hands. In other words, to give um, sovereignty or power to the people. Um, that's a quite quite a strong statement. I mean, that's not a statement from this paper, but that is a strong statement. In, in fact, to convey popular sovereignty to the people, that's the greatest sin of all. Um, so it's, I'm not I'm not clear if Bacon is making a counsel to the weak, um, but I think he may be. It is a count. It is as it were a conciliar definition, but it may be also what he thinks is the best one. So in other words, that, that those two might things might not be incompatible, right? And he's not. I mean, I've been, because people have kind of drawn me in this way um, to give contemporary examples, it's not really my wish to give contemporary examples, um, to think about whether the United States is at war with Canada. Um, Bacon might think that they're not actually separate states in some, you know, so Bacon might think that the United States is an imperial power, Canada is a province of the United States. Now they have discriminatory employment laws against um, United States citizens and that, you know, the protection, some kind of employment protectionism, but I don't think Bacon could actually say Canada is a province of the United States. Now it's not, you know, not de jure, but de facto. Um, and he might also say, well, the United States has a has a global empire. If you know, if we're if we're if we're going on this now, this is not the direction of my paper. It's not the thrust of the historical argument. The United States is a global empire. There was war 
in those parts of the, of, of the world where the United States was engaged militarily, for example, in Afghanistan and Iraq over the course of the last 20 years, um, and those things turned out badly. Um, but they can consider that. But for the most part, in D.C., there was peace. And in, um, in Austin, Texas, there was peace. And in Boston and in Durham, there was peace. I, don't, I mean, I think he can say all of those things to some extent. I think he kind of want, would want to say all of those things. I mean, not would want, but that's also, those aren't his examples. And his examples are Britain, Rome. Um, I don't know, Professor, am I, am I speaking? Yeah. So I think, yeah. so I think I don't know if there's Rome. any Canadians in our midst who would like to take exception. Professor Orwin. Professor Usually Orwin in is these Canadian. crowds, there's a few uh, Canadians. And I, yeah, there, there's Alex. Canadian. I don't know. And Emma, Alex Emma, Emma Ponings, Emma Ponings Alex Canadian. Converted, um, uh, all the Toronto people, all the you know, you Toronto PhDs, you Toronto um, upbringings, they're all Canadians, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I wish I was Canadian because I could work in Canada. You have many natural resources. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so your options, Alex, are you can either regard yourself as a province of the United States or at war with the United States. Right. I think that takes us too far, perhaps too far from Bacon. But I think you, the excellent part of your question, Professor Stauffer, is Bacon can both say, A, that he's offering the best definition of peace. And I think he can also say that um, he is giving counsel. And, you know, and I think he, you know, it's, I think, or, and he wouldn't necessarily present, um, he wouldn't necessarily present those two things as, as different. Yeah. Even for example, the essays, the subtitle of the essays are the essays or counsels, civil and moral. In other words, and I would read the or as an or of equivalence, right? The essays themselves are counsels. Um, and parts, parts of this, I guess, parts of, What's being presented as the definition are being drawn from that. Um, so I would say that he's also trying, he's doing both of those things. Um, Thanks. So that's a great question. I don't know if that, am I speaking to you the question? We, yes. Yeah. Can, and the candidate example is also great too, but I maybe went too far. So maybe just get, on my screen, I have um, Professor Wilford, Professor Hanley, Professor Scott, Professor Clinton, and Professor Orwin in that order. Uh, Sam, it's, uh, it's lovely to see you, even if only virtually. Um, it's lovely to see you too. It's lovely to see you too. I, uh, this definition that Bacon gives us of peace um, is one in which peace ex exists or is maintained as long as comparative military advantage is sufficiently great uh, between two states. It sounds like he's sort of just tweaking, or what echoed for me as we're talking is. Uh, Machiavelli's remark in chapter 14 of The Prince that a prince should never lift his thought from the exercise of war. And in peace, he should exercise it more than in war. So it seems as though uh, what Bacon is presenting as a theory of peace is, uh, is a sort of just like weak or a modification of Machiavelli's advice that the prince, even in peace, should be thinking about war. Or to put it you know, to bring them slightly closer together, Machiavelli's advice to the prince is, uh, when at peace, think more about war in order to stay at peace. But that really means you're always at war. Yeah, I think that's excellent. I mean, there's, I think it's in of goodness and goodness of nature, of goodness, uh, of goodness and goodness of nature. Bacon says, we are much indebted to Machiavelli. Um, you know, in many things, um, and I think in this as well. No, I, I, I take that. I mean, I take that on. I mean, also Bacon's debt to Machiavelli is a C, right? It's Machiavelli. It, you know, it's it's coextensive with Machiavelli, or one could say that's maybe too too much. But it, but one would err, one would make fewer errors by saying that than saying the opposite thing. I think. Um, Professor Hanley, I don't know, Professor. I mean, I I agree with basically. I agree with your statement. Um, Professor Henry. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, I want to actually continue because as fascinating as, uh, as Bacon's definition of um, peace is, I was actually quite fascinated by the uh, way you set it up with his definition of war, which I thought was very striking. And so I wonder if you could just say a few more words. To, to, I, I'm the furthest thing from a, from a late 16th century, early 17th century specialist about the singularity of that definition and where it comes from. Because it's, to, I mean, to this non specialist ear, it sounds like the uh, sort of application to international relations of medieval theories of judicial combat, 
Uh, and so I'm just sort of wondering where he got this from, how singular it was, or maybe there's a particular just war tradition that he's drawing on that I'm just unfamiliar with. So I know that a lot of the work we've been doing has been talking about his theory of peace and how that influences moving forward into the later 17th century. But I wonder if you could take a little bit uh, of a step back and talk more about his theory of war and um, some of the intellectual antecedents and his originality on that front. Excellent. Yeah, Bacon is at, in the Inns of Court. Bacon shares an Inns of Court with Alberico Gentili, um, who would have actually lectured at Oxford. And this goes back to Professor Fumarescu's question earlier. Maybe Professor Fumarescu has left, um, but um, who would have lectured at, at Oxford when Hobbes was there? Um, oh, he's returned. He's returned, which is great. Um, so ba Bacon actually shares a lot with um, Gentili and in um, De, De Uri Belli. Um, so, so um, which is also something that John Harpham at University of Chicago, but did Harvard PhD, a Duke undergrad, um, has work, is working on working on well on the intellectual origins of slavery. So they're close. And also, for example, Gentili's book is dedicated to the Earl of Essex. There are other positions in the Essex circle, um, Matthew Sutcliffe, also Bacon, Gentili, that have similar definitions. So in, in some sense, Bacon may not be such an outlier within that circle, which favors, which is the circle that favors a more militant posture towards Spain. That goes back to Professor Stauffer's question good, and good point um, that um, it is a militarist definition and it is the definition as it were of a party um, that has its own just war theory, but it's, uh, you, and as Bacon develops it, it becomes a kind of hair trigger just war theory. That may be unique to Bacon. Um, Bacon thinks that, for example, if Spain built a ship um, that could be used in an armada, that building of the ship is a sufficient cause of war for England and then Britain to invade. Um, and Gentili doesn't have that hair trigger position. Um, so that does actually cut, cut Bacon out from even from his more militant um, contemporaries and as it were compatriots and co-partisans um, who favor a more militant posture of England and Britain towards Spain. Uh, Professor. Yeah, hi, um, thanks. I think Ryan kind of answers my question or asked my question as well. I was wondering since you, to take Aline's question, but turn the arrow of time the other direction, uh, not whether Hobbes was engaging with Bacon on this question, but rather with whom is Bacon engaging? And so I think, uh, I don't know if you want to expand on that. I'd see, I wondered, for the paper that you, we read as a compared to the larger project, the paper we read was rather, uh, it seemed like Bacon's definitions uh, as you treated them were more polemical or policy oriented, let's say, as compared to theoretical in nature. So I don't know if you want to expand on what sort of, uh, sort of philosophical or uh, other types of, um, <clears throat> like the use Gantam you mentioned earlier, um, uh, traditions is Bacon engaged in or responding to or, um, or in all, apart from Gentile. So thanks. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, I mean, it's worth keeping in mind, Bacon, Bacon is a lawyer, right? Um, and he's a state's counsel. Um, and so in consideration of studying war with Spain, Bacon is keen to show that um, the theory of Suarez and um, Aquinas would actually justify English and British war against <clears throat> Spain. So Bacon's keen on taking, as it were, and this is true, this goes back to Professor Gillespie's question um, on the Howards. He's interested in using um, the testimony of the accused or even the authorities of the accused or the weapons of the accused against, um, against that person or against the party that he's trying to, that he's trying in court. Um, and so in trying war with Spain, he says, well, the Spanish, they take Aquinas and they take Suarez as authorities. Let me try to justify on um, you know, Thomistic and Thomistic grounds why um, war with Spain would be justified. And so he, you know, there's which he wouldn't do um, if he were um, wanting to make war on the Netherlands, which he of course does not want. Um, so he, so there is an element of using the testimony of the accused. He also does that when he puts Essex on trial, and Essex actually stands up and objects and actually pleads Bacon's words against Bacon, so against the counsel that's trying him. But Essex is also cognizant that, and knows Bacon incredibly well, that that's always Bacon's favored, um, favored strategy in court. Incidentally, you know, across time, you know, Bacon is a kind of Ciceronian rhetorician as well, but so is Schmidt, and Schmidt does that too. I mean, so if, if one wants to jump across time um, amongst states council, that's a very effective, um, effect, effective strategy for convicting people at the bar. 
And does that speak speak to your point? Yeah. So Bacon, Bacon, also, Bacon is confined not only by the, by, his, by the parties he favors, Gentile, Essex, Sutcliffe, um, but also by the things he's against, and actually using the weapons of the enemy, as it were, against that enemy themselves. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, I have uh, Professor Clinton, then Professor Orwin, Professor Schell, and then Ben Schwab. Uh, thank you. Just getting back to the to the history that Bacon knew. If I understand the uh, Bacon's position correctly, um, Rome could have lost the Jewish war. It could have failed to impose its will on Jerusalem without being at war, since the security of the Roman metropole was not at stake. So it it would not have been in a position of peace in the sense of acting as a common judge in relations with the Jewish people, um, but it would not have been at war either. There, this may get back to the question that Professor Rarita was raising. There, there seems to be a gap in which you are neither, you, you don't have peace in the sense of a common judge <laughs> whose rulings are effective on both parties, but nor are you at war, at least on your side, because your security at home is not threatened. But does that mean then, again, getting back to an earlier question, that you are always potentially at war with everyone if any party develops the technological means of threatening you? I think the answer to the last question is yes. Um, but, but to the extent that other parties have the technological means to attack you um, and the military capacity to attack you, Bacon would think that they are at least possibly or potentially um, your enemy. Does that, does that does this speak to your, your point? But I guess I, I do take the point that throughout the paper, there's a fluctuation and I, I need to address this. There's a fluctuation between you know what is what is as it were the object of impuissance to do hurt right so that's the definition that Bacon recurs to really across his literary philosophical and political career but hurt to what right and I've said in the paper hurt to the metropole but you could also say territorial integrity of you know if it's an imperial unit the territorial integrity its power um, and obviously Roman power would be hurt had um, the married Barkovba been successful um, so that would it would sh it would sh shift it. Um, but yeah, I guess it's maybe the question is you say ultimate hurt to one's power. But if you if you if you stretch the definition too much, I guess you kind of get into Sorides paradoxes, right? So if one soldier dies, but is it an irreplaceable soldier? Two soldiers die, is that actually hurt to the empire? Um, so I don't I don't know. What, what do you think about that? How how would you approach how would you approach um, retailoring the scope of impuissance to do hurt um, such that it's more consistent throughout? Um, I I don't know that I. I could give a good answer to that question, and it may be inherently ambiguous, um, but I, I do think that it, it seems to open up a realm, a state of affairs, a relationship which fully meets neither Bacon's definition of peace nor his definition of war at least from the point of view of the holder of superior power who is still and all not capable of imposing its will on every other single power and conquering it and acting as a judge in its own behalf everywhere. And then one would seem to be in the place um, in the opening act of Coriolanus, where one of the characters says, you know, what's the matter, you dissentious rogues that like nor peace nor war? And, and so, yeah, that, I would, but it's a difficult, you do have that potential space where you do have neither peace nor war. But you also, that may also speak to something in international relations itself, right? There may be, as it were, liminal spaces in which one has neither. Um, yes. You know, in, precisely between um, spaces. You, well, here, here, if you want, a, if one wants a 20th century example, between the Munich Peace Conference and the invasion of Poland in Europe, that would seem to be a neither peace, you know, neither peace nor overt conflict. Although in Czech Czechoslovakia, conflict, but that might be that might be a potential liminal space where one doesn't have either. 
Yes. Um, and so in, in that regard, Bacon's definitions actually speak to something, a, a potential fact of international politics. Yes. What do you think I, about that? Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, I suppose the only, the only point would be the definitional one, that we would just have to accept that the, the definitions of peace and of war do not between them exhaust all the space there is. And it is not true that everything that is not peace is war or everything that is not war is peace. And I think Bacon could take that as a friendly amendment to his view. Well, uh, that, that satisfies my ambitions then. Good, good. Uh, Professor Orwin? Alexander Orwin? I don't know. Oh, this one. Oh, here we go. Yeah, well, uh, I found your, your account of uh, Bacon's politics, right, both in this article and another one that I encountered, right, on uh, Bacon and colonialism, is interesting because it does treat the politics as separate from you know, his project for modern science, or at least sort of abstract from his project for modern science. And I never thought that that was something that could be done. And he says things, for example, in the Noam Organum that all ambitions, you know, pale in comparison with the ambition of science to transform the world. So wouldn't it be possible to view his teachings on war, peace, and empire you know, in this light? I mean, particularly that he thought that you know, scientific countries would become more powerful than other countries. They would gradually come to dominate the world. Therefore, it was in his interest to establish an international order, which essentially justify war, privilege the rule of the stronger, encourage empire, and foresaw empire as a means to spread science. Um, and you know, without that context, I'm not sure if we can have a you know, persuasive interpretation of you know, his discussions of war and peace, since he himself says in his scientific works that science is the most important thing. So I, I take your point well. I mean, I, so I guess um, at least on my understanding, I don't understand what I'm doing to be divorcing Baconian science from uh, Baconian politics. So the alternative to um, a British empire is a live one in his time, is, a span is as it were, the international, international is a Spanish empire. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind, the Inquisition lasts a long time in the Spanish empire, empire. So if you read Cecil Roth's History of the Spanish Inquisition, it runs into the 19th century. Um, the international Inquisition, from Bacon's perspective, and maybe he's wrong, um, is that the Inquisition is not an international order favorable to science. And thus, everything that Bacon targets in his international policies is really directed toward um, constraining Spain, um, constraining Spain, constraining the Spanish Inquisition. Um, do you, would, you, would you accept that? And also say, or, or what, do you, what do you think about that? Um, as, as, a, as, a, as it were, um, a modification of the position. So it's, in other words, present, presenting Bacon as um, stopping that. And Bacon maybe goes further in anti-Spanish propaganda than that. But I think that at least as a minimal condition for securing the empire of science, one needs to, as it were, defeat the contemporary alternative that is actually more powerful than science, at least in militarily and in, in terms of world conquest. I guess, I, th I think that's a very uh, good point. I mean, so would you argue that the Treaty of London, for example, is opposition, but was partly on those grounds that he wanted to really continue the war with Spain? Uh, until yeah. Spain was decisively defeated and deprived of its empire. Yeah, and the, right. So the, the bacon is not, and he also doesn't think he doesn't think it actually ends. He doesn't think it ends the war because Spain can continue to um, rebuild militarily and actually um, alter the power gradient between um, England and at, by 1604 Britain um, and Spain itself. And you think that you know his ambitions went further than that? Um, you know, for example, again, it would be in Britain's interest, right? If it wants to spread science to the new world and we go as far as Asia, I mean, Spain, and given the insane ambitiousness of some of what he proposes in the Noah Morgan, wouldn't Spain just be, defeating Spain just be the beginning? It would just be the beginning, but it would be an important beginning from Baconian perspective. But at the same time, also Bacon, Bacon proposes toleration, yeah, toleration as it were imperial spaces, um, the non-imposition of the Inquisition. Uh, Bacon also says, I mean, in one anti-Spanish um, pamphlet in the Certain Observations Upon a Libel, Bacon goes so far as to actually say that, be, that um, 
hanging, drawing, and quartering people, which is the punishment for being caught as a Jesuit on English soil, that that's actually a more humane punishment than being burned at the stake. And there's an obvious um, anti-Spanish uh, parallel. Maybe people are always justifying their penal practices in relation to others and saying those are more humane, um, but Bacon does that um, in anti-Spanish and as it were anti-Catholic uh, imperial propaganda. Um, but so but so I do think that it, his ambitions go beyond it, but also at the same time, they also, they're at some level more constrained, right? He doesn't favor the Inquisition in Spain or in England or in Peru. Um, and he actually, so he's, he actually thinks that for the colonized, English and imperial English imperial rule is better than Spanish imperial rule, and that one has and one, one faces a binary out, binary choice between the two of them. You're going to have either one of those two alternatives, and Bacon favors his own power. Does that does that speak to your point? Yes, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah thank uh, so, Professor Shell. Um, thanks a lot for a really interesting paper and a really interesting discussion. I guess my is my question is pretty simple. And it's kind of a follow up to Alex's question. Um, namely, I mean, I wonder if you could say something about the potentially uh, divergent ends of Hobbes and Bacon with and how that affects their different views of, of war and peace. And if the spread of science, I mean, both of them obviously favor the spread of science, but if the spread of science counts more for Bacon, if it's not his ultimate end, it's, it's a penultimate end, let's say, um, or if glory figures in a way for Bacon that it doesn't figure for Hobbes, uh, you know, if security is a, is a has a higher you know value for Hobbes than it both for the both for the ruler and for the Commonwealth, um, you know, how does that how do we figure that aspect in? I mean, to what extent do Hobbes's and Bacon's ends overlap, and if they don't, uh, what what does one make of that in terms of your own juxtaposition? Uh, yeah, no, it's a, that's a, it's a really good question. So, um, I mean, this, and it relates to Professor Orwin's question, you know, founding the order of science would be um, maybe the pinnacle of glory for, for Bacon, even if even it's not the pinnacle of intellection or the pinnacle of happiness, uh, maybe philosophy makes you happier, um, but it doesn't make you more uh, glorified and, you know, conquering, but also um, the conquest of nature from Bacon's perspective would be something he favors more. Um, and that would be true for the ruler, but it's true for the inventor. And if one goes to the New Atlantis, one has you know, Columbus, both Columbus, but also, also other inventors are praised um, and given, given the positions of glory. And in social life, the scientists are given the highest um, set. They get 50 page boys to follow them around, which Bacon would approve of. Um, so there are, many, there are many worldly goods that are given to the scientists from Bacon's perspective. Where does Hobbes differ from that? I think he thinks that um, he doesn't favor, he thinks that militiz, militarism abroad can destroy sovereignty at home. Um, and I guess uh, Professor Glebsey has just written in the, in the chat that the Atlantans don't pursue empire. They pursue the, as it were, the empire of light, as it were, they, they, they pursue, and they also, they satisfy the Baconian definition of peace because no one knows they exist. Um, and no one can um, overpower them because um, there, and as it were, no, all other powers are impuissant to do hurt to the Atlantans because they don't know that they're there. Um, so actually the Atlantis itself satisfies what's being called in the paper, um, the definition of peace. Would this, but, can I just ask, would, the, with respect to science and war, would that mean that the possibility for science in that sense would eliminate the possibility for war? England too is an uh, island. If England had superior science, would that they wouldn't have to worry about other powers. That's, I think from a Baconian perspective, that's true. It's also true for, for Atlanta, for, for the Benzlamites, let's say in the New Atlantis, the Benzlamites do do, do research on, on military technology. Um, this that remains within their ambit, even though um, no one knows that they're there and they can control, potentially control the winds. They do, re, you know, they have many powers beyond um, military powers, but also powers that are, um, have, have military salience, let's say. And they're invisible. No one knows that they exist. So, and in that world, uh, all their powers are impuissant to do them hurt. Can I just sort of follow up to make me make my question a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, in other words, do they both agree that that for all practical purposes, security is most important, and they just disagree on how you get it, or is there some other fundamental disagreement? Is yeah. it just about the means, or is it also the ends? 
I think that that's, I think it's a question about means and which, yeah, which means are efficacious. Um, so the ends are the that, same. The ends are the same, it's just a difference of opinion about means. And yeah, but I guess the question, the question is what do you, what does one do about Spain? I think Hobbes is less um, antagonistic potentially to Spanish power. Um, and and less so antagonistic. I'm not so interested in the particulars of that particular setting as in general, from theoretically, ultimately, is, is for all practical purposes, security from the point of view of practical politics, the most important thing. And then they just disagree on in, in this particular setting or in, in most settings, how you arrive at it, or is there some more fundamental disagreement about the ends? Yeah, I, I think they don't disagree about ends, but I think they, they do disagree about means and they disagree about um, persons I'm too. I mean, sure it's also, you know, I'm not so sure of that, but, but that's- So here's, here's an example. So for ch chapter 19 of Leviathan, to go to Leviathan, Hobbes calls James our most wise king. I think Bacon can't say that um, and wouldn't say that. I think Bacon thinks that James is not so smart. Um, that they, they think he's smarter. I mean, also he's 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 at the council table with you know he's he's at the head of the privy council table for James, and I think he doesn't think that James's reign um, brought about peace. Uh, but Hobbes actually thinks well, J James did a really good job. He you know just by negotiation and marrying people or trying to marry people, he kept he kept us out of military conflict. So this kind of um, almost you know, using 20th century vocabulary is too strong, but. Um, a greater amount of restraint in military matters in terms of strategy, but also in terms of pr practice, Hobbes favors. But I think your point, I don't think they ultimately have their friends, right? I mean, they're philosophers, they're fr philosophers and friends. Well, okay, let um, me just put it the most pointed way. And again, I'm not gonna, this is just uh, hypothetically, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna argue this all the way, but that um, Hobbes in some sense really does care about justice. And, oh, Bacon, and Bacon, Bacon does. Bacon doesn't care, Bacon yeah. doesn't care about justice. No, yeah, no, Bacon yeah. doesn't care so about justice. That's a difference. That's a real, no, that's a real difference. And, and here would be another difference. Um, Hobbes seems, you know, for example, in chapters 14, 15 of Leviathan, Hobbes seems to say, you shouldn't torture people or you shouldn't engage in cruelty. Bacon um, not only did torture people, he endorses it in his writings. I mean, he endorses torturing the fruit in well, Civil Solaro. But arguably Solara. Hobbes does that for, for security reasons and not because he ultimately thinks it's, it's wicked. Um, so again, that can, that can be argued both ways. Anyway, sure, I don't right. want to monopolize your the little time you have left. This is really interesting. So thank you. No, but also th thank you. But I also think um, there there are differences. But I think they do have yeah they have sim similar similar ends. I guess justice justice is an issue. But Bacon, Bacon thinks you should have order, um, but sometimes you need to have severity to have order. And I guess he's more inclined toward the potentiality of severity for bringing about order, both inter internationally and domestically. Um, so maybe he's closer to Machiavelli in this regard. And, uh, um, uh, professor Sch uh, Sch Schwab and then uh, Professor Russo here. Yeah, hi, thanks for coming. Um, I think this may have been touched on indirectly already, but uh, especially in your response to Professor Orwin. But I, I'm, I'm curious what you make of how this developed Baconian definition of peace uh, moved, you know, sort of reflects back on the discussion of peace and war within religions. And so I'd, I guess I would, I would put this in three short sub-questions. First, does it, does this fully de developed definition, which you draw from multiple sources, end up reflecting on the discussion of peace in the essay on the unity of religion? And then if so, too, what does this mean for the internal stance that the statesman must take towards religion, if this is how we ought to understand conflict between religions? And then third, if this does apply, then do we have to expand our understanding of harm in the external or foreign sphere of things? That is, does not the fact that religions also operate through this manner of conflict mean that we have to incorporate the influence of foreign religions or other foreign influences into our assessment of what war and peace between nations would require, especially given the opening sentence of the essay that religion is, forms the common bond? amongst society and the, the treatments and other Baconian works of the importance or the way that outside, you know, ideas can also have, you know, corrupting influences on the internal government of the polity. Could you repeat the first, the first part of the question? Well, basically, the way you seem to, to develop the definition is to start from this discussion in the SM religion, which reflects two definitions of false peace, and then to bring in elements of other Baconi works to create a fully, I would say, developed definition of how Bacon understands true and false peace are in the context between nations. 
so the first part was, was just to say whether you think this fully de de uh, developed definition applies to how Bacon thinks of what you might call, call the tension between religions as well as states, if we can make so fine a distinction. Yeah, so I guess I'll start with this. I'll start with the second part of second part. U.S. So the stance of the statesman toward religion. Bacon says even if you're in, so in of atheism and in of superstition. Bacon, Bacon says if you're an atheist, you know you, sh you shouldn't bother. You should just keep it to your. You should keep it to yourself. Um, you, it, it doesn't make any difference. You you shouldn't try to convert people to atheism. Um, you should just hold it hold it in. Um, and I think that that's also what he does. He has to confess faith at various moments. Um, but it is a, quite a strong thing to say in essays um, on atheism and on superstition to say, well, if you're an atheist, you don't have to share that. You can just be quiet about that. Um, you can keep that to yourself. I think that that, you know, insofar as that's a, a statement for the philosopher or a statement for the state's person, um, I think that's something that Bacon himself could affirm um, what he says about atheists. Or whether there should be peace between religions, I guess Bacon raises a question about, it depends on the religion in some sense for him. Um, and he does, I think, think that there could be peace between Christianity and Judaism or a certain Christianity and a certain Judaism. Um, so that it depends on, on the form of the religion, but more militant forms of religion, including this goes back to Professor Orwood's question, you know, there can not really be peace between as it were the inquisition and science, let's say, or a religion that favors science and a religion that, you know, a country and religion that favors science and a country and religion that favors the Inquisition, something like this. Um, can you repeat your thir the third part of the question? Uh, my question would be that if we should understand peace and war between religions along the same lines of incapacity to harm, should we not apply this to a more broader understanding of harm that the statesman must face in what we might call generally international relations. And so not simply have them evaluate the ability of another state or group to physically harm the country, but end it as a possessing outside, you know, what we call ideational influences that could also possess this capacity to harm. Um, and if you think yeah, Bacon think has that in mind already when he's understanding the role of the statesman. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I think, um, right, that you can't really detach, um, you can't really detach the Inquisition from the state, let's say. I mean, you, you can, but you also can't. Um, you need a state apparatus to do that. Um, but, right, I mean, I think he is interested in that question culturally as well. Um, he, he's, he lives in France in the 1570s. He sees the wars of religion, right? So he's in the English embassy from 1576 to 1579. Um, he has a picture of Henri Quet in his, you know, in his study. Um, so he, you know, there's also an image of toleration, right? For, for the Edict of Nantes, he also, he likes that, that image of, yeah, a tolerant peace um, and, and a world that could accommodate um, both a Protestant and a non-inquisitorial Catholic population, he's, he's for it. Um, I don't know if that speaks to your question, but I do, th so I think you raise a good point about um, Bacon's concern with the possibility, not only of peace between states, but also of peace between different religions and peace, peace between, as it were, different ideational influences. Have I spoken to the different parts of your question? Yeah, basically my, my point would be that it, it seems that if we were to apply this definition to religions, especially on a, you know, religions as the influence geopolitically or, or as tied to a state, then it seems not very tolerant um, of a position the statesman would have to take. Um, if you have to be worried about the capacity of other religious states or even religions themselves, not attached states, to affect the in internal union of your own if it is dependent on, on religion. Um, and so that, I mean, per perhaps that's simply to, to put a, a limit on, on toleration, um, but it, it, it seemed somewhat discordant with, with the, the suggestions you're making earlier about this sort of desire for toleration. I was just curious how you'd reconcile the two. Well, I, I, Sam, I, I don't want to preclude, I, I, I want to give you a chance to answer that, but I do also want to make sure since we're coming to the end of our hour, we have one more questioner uh, as well on the table. So I wonder if we might let Genevieve uh, jump in here. Um, Thank you. Okay, hi, Sam. Um, 
Yeah, really, my question is quite general, so it will give you an opportunity to uh, make sort of a final statement. Um, so listening to you and reading your paper, I really learned a lot about Bacon. I'm fairly ignorant about Bacon, so I learned a lot anyways. Um, and I learned in particular about all the strategic and contextual reasons why Bacon would enter um, the understanding of peace that he has. Um, so you make, you know, you have a lot of details about that. It's very erudite. The thing I still I'm not convinced about is whether he's... Um, his ideas here are philosophical in any relevant uh, sense of the term. And in particular, I, I really, I, I mean, it matters to your paper in the sense that we want to know whether this is just a historical contribution or if there is ultimately a theoretical upshot. And I really, I don't understand how his theory um, can be um, justified to anyone who is not English. So I think his theory is purely a policy. Um, it's you know, if you're not English, you either have to accept to, sub, to be subjected to English empire or just be uncertain all your life. Um, so it, I, I don't really see that as convincing in any ways. Uh, and also, and Suzanne Schell said that earlier, I mean, if you think about Hobbes, if you compare to Hobbes, Hobbes really has a theory that connects order and justice. We may not be convinced by it, but he does have a lot to say about that. Here, I don't see anything, I don't see any argumentative step. Uh, to connect order and justice, what is the order of priorities? It seems to me completely ad hoc kind of um, policy, and or at least you know I would like to hear what you have to say about that. So can you? Yeah, so yeah. I guess it depends. It, it depends on what philosophy is, right? So also all of the great encyclopedists. Um, D'Alembert, Diderot, they all think that Bacon is a great philosopher. You know, all the people in your period, um, Rousseau, um, for example, the first discourse says that the Lord Chancellor is perhaps the wisest person who ever lived or something to that effect. Uh, but you would know that better, right? I mean, I'm but, talking about political philosopher here. Right, so, right, but that, that's quite high praise from Rousseau, right? I mean, where does, where else does Rousseau praise someone so highly as he praises Bacon um, in the first, in the first discourse? But Bacon is also, you know, he's a philosopher not only of politics, but also of experiments. He's torturing the fruit. He's, you know, experimenting with harmonics. Um, you know, he, he's doing um, experiments about smell, olfactory experiments. So I guess it depends on what, what is a philosopher, right? And that's a, that's a big, big question, right? And maybe someone who, who questions everything, um, who raises a question about everything or puts everything into question. You may, that's a skept maybe too skeptical a definition. Um, but the question is, is a political philosopher someone who gives a universal theory of things? Um, or is it someone who's, who's universally questioning Right? So there's a, there's, a, there's a question about what philosophy is and an associated question about what a philosopher is. Right? And if you're asking the question, if you, if you have Bacon as someone who's questioning everything more than um, giving a theory of everything, partially because Bacon, there are points in Bacon where he says, actually, we don't have any premises that are certain. I mean, so that's actually quite, um, that's maybe Bacon in a skeptical mode. Um, but he also is, as it were, giving counsels and maybe giving what he takes to be the best counsels and some of those involve giving what he takes to be the best definitions. But I may not be convinced by this and, and maybe no English person is meant to be convinced by this. And, and here's, here's an example of that. Bacon translates and has translated many of his works into Latin, um, but also into Italian. Um, he can write in French, so he could have written the text in French. Probably he should have written, I mean, it would be even better, Bacon's writing, if he wrote in French, and that because it's better. But so that those are, those are good things. He could have done that, right? So any Baconian text, he can produce it in Latin, either himself or he can have it done. Most of the texts that I'm quoting in this paper were not, at least in his lifetime, translated into either Latin or French or Italian. Some of them were, but, but the texts on peace, mostly not. So that I think actually goes to the point of your good question, which is also Bacon's not trying to persuade an, any, anyone other than actually a very confined English audience, and especially um, a politically powerful audience in England, especially a monarchic and regal audience to enact the policies that he favors, which, are, which is war with Spain. So it is, it is in the sense, um, it is in the sense polemical. So it's a polemical definition of peace. And it isn't necessarily meant to be a universal theory, but, Maybe if we lived in a, a world, an international world, a, a peaceful international world, um, maybe everyone would be better off. I mean, so there, there's still some, some sense of this in Bacon, perhaps. I don't know if, am I speaking to your question? Parfois, but that's a little bit, a little bit. But do, do you have a follow, is there a follow-up or are there parts of, parts of it that I could come back on? 
Um, yeah, I follow, but it's on. Uh, I you partially answered, but it's four thirty-two. So I think Ryan wants to uh, exercise some discipline on the group. <laughs> sure, throw me under the bus for that. That's, uh, <laughs> it probably is incumbent upon me to uh, at least let our uh, esteemed speaker off the hook here. Uh, please, we all join me in thanking Sam uh, for a very rousing conversation, excellent paper. We're very grateful, and thanking also uh, our hosts at Houston for putting together this wonderful workshop. I think we're all very much in Jeff's debt. So, thank you all again. Yeah.